Joining us today is Henry Desposito, Senior Research Analyst in the Washington Office of JLL, which recently released its construction outlook for the second half of 2020 and beyond. That report forecasts a non-residential construction decline this year of between 10 and 15%, despite a reopening bounce, stabilizing at a lower base next year and returning to modest growth in 2022. Henry, welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Henry, uh, JLL's latest report for season on even recovery for non-residential construction and offers several forecasts that could shape the industry through the, through the remainder of this year and into next year. Let's discuss each of these in a bit more detail. Number one, COVID-19 isn't going away anytime soon, and there could be a future construction showdown, uh, showdowns, shutdowns, <laughs> uh, and showdowns. Uh, um, tell me a little bit about what uh, prompted JLL to make that prediction. Sure, absolutely. Well, I guess one thing that I do want to make sure is, is very clear is that we don't expect that there will be shutdowns. I think what you have to look at is compared to a year ago, right? 12 months ago, did anyone think a full city would shut down construction? Absolutely not. So there's, there's a risk, right? And it's much higher than it has been any time in the past. If from a health perspective, things were to get worse, there's always that possibility. So it's something to plan for. What we do expect over the next year is that while sites won't shut down, firms will have to operate with these additional COVID safety protocols in place. So whether that's contact tracing, uh, health screening, questionnaires, additional hand washing stations, making sure that workers are socially distanced on job sites. And that's always the toughest one in terms of impact on the project itself. So all those will be ongoing for six months, 12 months, two years. No one really knows the answer. So I think the big risk is the unknown and how long will job sites need to operate that way. And then at the same time, making sure you are prepared if things were to get worse because we saw it happen earlier this year, obviously, and there's a possibility it could happen again. Although one good thing I think the industry has taken away from this and sort of construction at large is learning a lot more about how to operate in these conditions. So mm. those, sh those shutdowns came from a place of we've never been through this before, both from the governmental perspective and also for contractors too. And so now that we all know how to work and to live on our, you know, our day to day lives with the pandemic, that's going to really reduce the risk of another shutdown because we can just work through it rather than having to stop entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two, public yeah. sector, sector spending, a primary industry growth driver is drying up. What does that yeah. mean for, what should people be looking out for? Sure. So when we look back over the past few years, private spending in non-residential has really been flat. There hasn't been much change for the past two to three years. Really what's been driving that growth has been public sector spending and an increase by at least a few percent a year to keep things moving up. Uh, the challenge now is that for state and local governments, their revenue streams have really been impacted significantly by COVID, right? Without all the different levels of tax income they usually get, a lot of it's even just sales tax from people going out to restaurants and shopping with those revenue streams drying up and also transportation too, you know, similar people aren't driving or taking public transit or buying gas, there's less revenue coming in. So the result we've seen is that a lot of cities are pulling back on their capital spending as much as they can for now. Mm -hmm. And so that's impacted already transportation infrastructure. It's impacted sort of long-term plans where cities say we're going to spend $10 billion over the next two years or next 10 years to do this work on the metro or this work on you know, improving road conditions, whatever the case may be a lot of that's on hold and if it is moving forward cities certainly aren't spending more so that's really from the state and local government side of things that's where we see the challenges coming there's a potential for some sort of bigger infrastructure stimulus package from the federal government which could help mitigate that but that's not something at this point that's a certainty by any stretch what is a certainty is these budget shortfalls for state and local governments if money comes from the federal government that would be a great help, but it's not going to compensate for where we're seeing a lot of spending pullback, at least for the next year until these budgets can sort of stabilize and, and states and cities can get a feel for how much money they really will have to spend. Okay. Number three, the industry's confidence that market conditions are going to get better will remain negative and even more distinct by sector. 
Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about kind of how you see that playing out. Sure. So one of the ways that this pandemic has impacted things differently than what we've seen before really has been how some sectors have done so well, while others have done so poorly. So if you look at e-commerce, warehouse, or the industrial side of things, there's a ton of new demand for that type of space. Vacancy rates are down, and there's going to be, over the next few years, no decrease in people saying this is the kind of space I need to lease and the kind of space I need to build more of, right, for the future. On the flip side, if you're looking at something like um, whether it's retail or hospitality or entertainment, all these sectors that have been hit really hard by the pandemic, you have a, a condition where both there are fewer people looking to use that kind of space, and then as well, the operators and the owners there are having their own sort of operational financial challenges, right, just getting through COVID-19. So while we saw some of that divergence before, it's really exacerbated how some sectors have fared versus others. So that's sort of the uneven forecast we're talking about. There'll definitely be some growth, but you can't just say uniformly everything's going to grow 2% or things going to fall 5%. You mm-hmm. have to look a little closer and see how that's going to play out across the different sectors of the industry. Mm-hmm. The upcoming election in November is certainly on a lot of people's minds, uh, and there yeah. will be uncertain ramifications for construction, regardless of who wins. Um, I found I thought this was one of the more interesting predictions on your part. Tell me a little bit about your thought process there. Sure. So I think it's definitely on everyone's mind, right, one way or another, and there's a lot of volatility that will come from it either way. Either we'll see a continuation of what we've had the past four years or something different. And there's a number of things specific to construction that'll change one way or another. So one piece of that, like I mentioned before, is the infrastructure package. Mm -hmm. And that's not something we say necessarily that's definitely a Republican thing or definitely a Democratic thing, right? There's bipartisan support for that. Whether it actually happens, it could happen regardless of who wins both the White House and also in Congress. Some of the other pieces here around um, regulations, we've seen typically, you know, some parties listing regulations and kind of pulling back on what they've asked from an environmental perspective. And on on the other hand, from looking at labor regulations, right, and immigration regulations, Mm -hmm. there's a big difference between parties there too. So I think one of the things that we were both careful of, but also was true, is it's not like one's better and one's worse if you're looking just at construction, but they have different impacts and different parties have different priorities. So what's going to happen next year depends on which party wins, some for the better and some for the worse when you're looking at how it impacts construction. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, long-term construction sentiment is positive for the first time in years, and optimism about growth in the out years 2022 to 24 should be stronger. Uh, What's your uh, motivation for that type of uh, prediction? Sure. So I think what this really comes down to is that for the past five years or so, you could say even since maybe 20. 14, right? Since we fully came out of the last recession and started to grow again, there's been this sentiment in construction and across real estate that the next recession's a year or two away. So you can even look back at conferences or people having interviews like this saying, you know, well, two years from now, there's going to be a recession. And that two years from now sentiment has been true for many more than two years, right? So I think one positive thing we're seeing is this much anticipated recession is now finally here. And so as a result, that sort of negative overhang of, I don't want to be too overextended or too overexposed because two years from now, I don't want to be caught out like I was 10 years ago or 12 years ago in the last recession. So now that we're here and everything's kind of down already, that fear of, oh, it's the longest expansion in post-war history. Oh, it can't keep going forever. That's kind of gone. So Although there are challenges today for the next 12 months and for as long as this pandemic lasts, one positive thing we see is that because sentiment is is so much stronger for two to three years out, that means that firms are going to keep investing in their people and their technology, want to keep pipelines full, and want to not lose market share. So that once we're done with this, hopefully in a year or so, who really knows, they can hit the ground running and not have lost the position they fought so hard for over the past few years. Lastly, um, uh, JLL predicts that one of the kind of unusual beneficiaries of the pandemic is uh, construction technology, and that you foresee an even firmer embrace of that in the industry going forward. Um, 
that is happening already. Uh, what do you, yeah. How do you think that's likely to play out? Yeah, so I think this is definitely true for, uh, for technology more, more broadly than construction, but in construction tech in spe specifically, one of the things that we've been watching is how challenging it is to sometimes pick a particular provider of technology and then also invest. For a firm to add new technology, there's a lot of time, a lot of effort to get the adoption up to get everyone used to it, to get it fully integrated into your existing systems. There's a big upfront cost. And when you're not certain what the payoff is, you're less likely to make that, kind of make that jump, right? Now, because you need it in so many more ways than you did before, so whether that's something like a digital collaboration tool where everything's cloud-based and you have your plans and your drawings and your meetings and all that, right? And you can go to a site and you have it all on your phone or your iPad even something as simple as that. There's no way you can really work without that now. And so what we've seen is that adoption has gone up for both those types of technologies and then also a little more forward thinking ones like 3D scanning or um, whether it's going out with like a, an automated tracking system or even sort of a contract tracing job site tracking, those types of tools. We've seen adoption go up for all of those and then what the important thing to note is here is that that won't fall back down after the pandemic's gone. It's not like we'll move past the pandemic and have a vaccine and go back to you know life as we knew it, and firms are going to cancel that, right? It's going to be part of their system. It's going to be already integrated, and they're going to see the efficiencies of it, and so that adoption will stay, and then it'll even snowball from there. So I think how we're really seeing is that this is going to be sort of a big impetus for adding construction technology. And then once that adoption's up, it just continues on and on and on down the hill as more people pick it up. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry, thanks for sharing your thoughts on this. Uh, we'll be avidly watching to see how many of your predictions are actually on target. And uh, yep. th thanks again for your time. Uh, this is John Caulfield with uh, Building Design and Construction. Thanks for watching.